Thanks for tuning in. We're so excited that you can join us. We're going to worship our King now. So would you stand and sing with us? are good.
Let's read the word of the Lord together now. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you. In the sight of the children of mankind, in the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. When I thought my foot slips, your steadfast love, O oh Lord, held me up. When the cares of my heart are many, your consolations cheer my soul. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever.
forevermore no matter what may come in life God no matter what situations we might be facing whether we are on the mountaintop or in the valley God we want to make praise just be something that we're always doing we want to worship you forever and ever Lord and God we just we stand here and awe as we just sang Lord how worthy, how great, and how wonderful you are, God. And Lord, we're honored, and we are just humbled that we can stand before you right now and lift up these songs to you, a worthy God, who is seated on the highest throne, who will reign forevermore. And we just pray, God, that as we are going to be now hearing your words, God, and digging into the word, that you gave us. We pray, God, that our hearts would be open and that as we're studying the scriptures, God, that we would be reminded of how just blessed we are to have this, to be able to hear your voice speaking through us through the scriptures, Lord. And we know that all scripture is breathed out by you, God. So help us to be focused and to just have open ears and open heart to hear what you have to say to your people this morning. God, we worship you. We praise you and we love you. We pray all of this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We're going to continue now in worshiping the Lord by digging into the Word together. Good morning, church. It's good to be with you in this fall season just started this week. We're completing our study on seeing our faith with 2020 vision. Last week, we began looking at our 2020 vision regarding serving. And today is going to be part two of our vision on serving. Now, we've covered a lot of ground in this summer series. We talked a lot about theology, the study of God. We looked at first God the Father for a number of sessions, and then God the Son and God the Spirit. Then we looked at God's will. What's his will for us as his children? And under that heading, we looked at what's God's will regarding prayer, regarding evangelism, worship, fellowship, and serving. What's God's will for us in those areas? And perhaps you finally have realized that we've slipped in our mission statement into this summer series. And our mission statement for a faith community church is we exist to develop passionate followers of Jesus Christ. And together we must pray. And then we break down the PRAY acronym for P, praising our God, reaching our world for God, which is evangelism, praising our God's worship, applying our spiritual gifts from God, that's serving, and of course, yielding ourselves to the Word of God, that's discipleship. Last week, my theme for serving was servanthood is a requirement of Christ followers. And as Christ followers, we are to imitate Jesus. Since he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many, 
Well, we, if we're going to imitate Jesus Christ, we are not here to be served, but we are here to serve, to serve God and to serve one another. And this morning, I would like to focus on the specifics of serving. And sadly, too many Christians view service as, as I spoke last week, a chore, a duty, instead of some awesome privilege of allowing the Spirit of God to work through us to accomplish great ministry for our Lord Jesus Christ. So my theme is simple this morning. It's God has given gifts to his children. Discover them and use them. In different passages in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, these spiritual gifts are often called, well, grace gifts or just grace or spirituals, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. So before we get to look at why should we use these gifts, uh, would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you thanking you for the summer series on Uh, Well, having a 2020 vision regarding the things that we believe in as a church. And today as we wrap up this series on service, the specifics of serving, we ask that you through the power of the Spirit would enlighten our eyes and our minds and our hearts to see that it is very important that each one of your children serves. So Lord, use me this morning to speak forth your word with clarity In Christ's name I pray, amen. So why should we use these gifts that God has given? Why should we discover them and use them? Well, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In fact, all three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, are dealing with gifts. And chapter 12, he gives a number of gifts. Chapter 13, it's, we call that the love chapter. But it says it doesn't matter what kind of gifts you have. If you don't have love, it's for naught. And then chapter 14, he says, when it comes to two of the gifts, prophesying and tongues, prophesying is to be preferred in the church. But we're going to look at chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bibles, follow along as I read. Now concerning spiritual gifts or spirituals, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the, same, by the one Spirit. And to another, the effecting of miracles, to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Why should we use these gifts? Well, the first point is the Spirit of God personally gave you your gifts. The Spirit of God personally gave you your gifts. In verses 1 through 3, I see that spiritual gifts are given to Christ followers. He's writing to the church, the Apostle Paul is. He's writing to the church, and he tells them, Brethren, I don't want you to be unaware. In verse 2, he says, Once you were pagans, once you were led astray to serve mute or dumb idols, however you were led. So before Christ, you were pagans led astray to serve and bow before speechless idols, lifeless idols. But now you're believers in Christ. That's why he says in verse 1, he calls them brethren, brothers and sisters. Now that you're believers in Christ, you have the Spirit. In verse 3, he's, he's speaking about that no one that has the Spirit of God can actually say Jesus is 
accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In that one verse, he's, he's putting the Spirit of God, equating that to the Holy Spirit, one and the same. And he's saying that you cannot, with the Spirit of God, say that Jesus is accursed. And it's with the Holy Spirit that you're able to say Jesus is Lord. A few times in my ministry here at Faith, I've been asked to help somebody who's been demonized, showing signs of demonization in them. And one of the first tests I give them is what's found here in the scripture in verse 3. After speaking with the individual, I ask them, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Many times they say yes. And then I would say, well, then what I'd like you to do is to say, Jesus is my only Lord. Can you say that? And most times if they're demonized, they have trouble saying that phrase. Then I know that they really need some help. And I would help them get rid of this demon if possible. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual gifts are given to Christ's followers. Now in verses 4 through following, we can see that spiritual gifts are given for the church's common good. It tells us in verse 4, he's using this idea of varieties. And he's, Paul is showing well, parallel ideas in verses 4, 5, and 6, because we have the word varieties or different kinds, as the NIV says, or diversities, as the New King James Version says. But varieties of what? Well, four, it's varieties of gifts. Charisma, gifts, grace, gift. And then you have in verse 5, varieties of ministries. It's where we get the word deacon, the noun form, ministries, meaning to serve. There's a variety of servings and a variety of effects or activities in verse 6. So although he's using parallelism to show gift diversity, he's showing unity of source. He's talking about the Trinity. In verse 4, we have the same Spirit. In verse 5, the same Lord, meaning Jesus. And then in verse 6, the same God, referring, I believe, to God the Father. So even though we have a variety of gifts, a variety of ministries, and a variety of effects, we have one source. It's God. And in verse 6, at the end, it says, it's God who works all things in all people. Or as some other versions say, in everyone. It's God who is working these things in you as the believer. Now in verse 7, it says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The gift is called a manifestation of the Spirit. To manifest is to show or to make visible. And so here we have the Spirit that's taking this gift and making it visible to others. Others observe that you have this gift. And the purpose of giving a variety of different gifts to the body of Christ is for the church's common good, as it says at the end of verse 7. Now, verses 8 through 11, we have a partial list of the gifts from the Spirit. If you, bring, if you download the notes that are on, um, well, on the website for you, you'll see that on the back side, I have given you a list of the gifts found in 1 Corinthians 12. And I'll just go briefly through them. In verse 8, we have the word of wisdom. This is the ability to apply spiritual knowledge and spiritual scriptural principles to complex issues. The word of knowledge is the ability to learn, to know, to explain information effectively, especially the truths of God's word. Faith is the ability to trust God in the face of insurmountable odds. Now, we're all to have faith, but some have an, a spiritual gift of faith. Gifts of healing, the ability to heal by the Spirit's power. The affecting or working of miracles. This is often called signs and wonders. Prophecy or prophet. It's the ability to speak forth God's message and secondarily to foretell of the future. Remember, there is a prophet named Agabus in the book of Acts who in Acts 11:28 predicted there would be a famine in the world. 
And then in Acts 21, verses 10 and 11, the same man, Agabus, predicted Paul's arrest. He took Paul's belt off and he kind of tied uh, Paul's hands together and says, this is what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. He could predict with God's help. Then we have the distinguishing of spirits. This is the ability to discern what is God of God and what is not of God, but of the demonic. 1 John 4, 1 tells us, test the spirits. So there's a spiritual gift of one who's got discernment to know which spirit is really at work. Kinds of tongues, it says in verse 10 and verse 28 and verse 30. Notice it says tongues, plural. It's not a singular tongue. It's the ability to speak in other languages. At Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, we have the word glossa, or tongues, being used with this other Greek word, dialectos, meaning languages. And they're equated together, tongues as languages. Then you have the interpretation of tongues. This is a person that makes known the language. That's not the common language of that people. Apostles, or apostleship. Apostle, apostelos, means to send out. Barnabas and Paul were both called apostles. So we have, in one sense, apostles, meaning the apostles that Christ himself chose. And also we have this sense of those who are sent out like a missionary, sent with a a message. Teacher or teaching, the ability to explain the scriptures with clarity and the ability to explain it to all different ages. Helps or serving. The ability and willingness to serve the body any way they can. The motto here is get her done. Whatever needs to get done, those that have the serving gifts, get her done in the church. Administration and leading. This is the ability to serve as a selfless leader within the church. Selfless, humble leader, similar to Jesus Christ. And then you can add to this list other gifts found in Scripture exhorts. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, these are people that encourage. They're just encouragers. One have gives. They give generously to the Lord's work. The Lord's given them ability to make money, and that way they can give large amounts of money to the Lord's work. The spiritual gift of giving. Showing mercy. They come beside hurting people. They listen and they help. They counsel. Evangelists in Ephesians 4.11, they speak the gospel with power in any kind of a situation and setting. And then pastors, teachers also in Ephesians 4.11, they are shepherds. They lead the flock. They care for the flock. They protect the flock and they feed the flock. They teach them the truth of God's word. The listing is on the back. I'm not going to go into depth on any of that, but In 1 Corinthians 12, in verses 8 through 11, you saw many of the gifts listed. listed. But notice specifically the end of verse 11, or the whole verse of it. But one and the same Spirit works in all these things, and notice it's the Spirit that distributes to each one individually just as He wills. The Spirit of God gives you your gift. And it's for the common good of the church. So why should we use our gifts? The Spirit of God personally gave you your gifts. Secondly, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. What I'll be reading, I think, is making the point here that the strength of a church is proportionately correlated to the number of people using their giftedness. That's a long sentence. Let me say it again. The strength of a church is proportionately correlated to the number of people using their giftedness. Paul in chapter 4, he begins talking about unity at the very beginning. In fact, verse 3, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice the unity in verses 4, 5, and 6. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Stressing unity. And then he gets to verse 7. 
And he says, but to each one of us, every believer in Christ, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. I believe this means each believer is given grace. Now, this is not saving grace. This is equipping grace, equipping to do ministry kind of grace. It's grace because it's undeserved. It's unearned. God gave you this grace. In fact, Christ's gift gave you this grace. And Jesus is the one who measured out this grace gift given to you. In verse 8, in the context, he quotes an Old Testament passage, which is Psalm 68, verse 18. But he quotes this passage just to stay at the last end of it, this phrase, and he gave gifts to men. Christ is the one who gives gifts like the Spirit to men. And then Paul lists in verse 11 four leadership positions that are in the church. He's not listing four gifts, but pretty much four positions. And the first one's apostles. In the technical sense, this is Christ's apostles. But it also can mean those who are sent out with a message. Prophets. Remember, the foundation of the church is built on the apostles and prophets. This is also the technical sense of meaning the authors of the New Testament, that holy men of old Moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote the scriptures. But it also can mean those who can speak forth for God. Evangelists, we've covered this already. These are those people who have a special gift of proclaiming the gospel in such a powerful way that it convicts the sinner and shows him need for salvation. Then you have pastor, teacher. This is really one focal point, not pastor and teacher, but really pastor, teacher. This is a shepherding gift with emphasis on feeding the flock, teaching them the word of God. And so he lists four leadership positions. And the purpose of these leadership positions is to equip the church. Notice what it says in verse 12. God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service. The saints means holy ones. It's a title that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. We are holy ones. We are saints, even though we're living now. You don't have to die to be a saint. You're a saint now. You're a holy one because of Jesus Christ. And so he says that these four leadership positions in the church has a purpose. It's to equip the saints for the work of the service. The leaders equip people, and people use their gifts to do ministry work. John Stott, he wrote in a book called One People, he wrote this, for this sentence, or sentences, there has developed within the church a division between clergy, meaning pastors or a priest, uh, those that are at leaders, between the clergy and the laity. Laity comes from a Greek word, laos, which means people. So there's a division between pastors and the people in which the clergy are supposed to lead and do the work of ministry while the people are to follow docilely, in other words, meekly. They're just to follow and, of course, give money to support the clergy and the work that they're doing. That's countercultural to what Paul is saying here in Ephesians 4.12. This is not what the church is to be, where the clergy does all the work and they do all the ministry. No, they're the equippers. The people are to be doing the work of the ministry. And if it's the view that the clergy does all the work and you pay them to do all the work, well, then both the church and its ministries will suffer. How can you test whether or not a church is thinking that the clergy should do the work. Well, look at the number of volunteers that are in ministries. The more people you have to pay to do ministry because you do not have volunteers, it shows you a church that you have many people who are not using their spiritual gift. And the church will end up suffering because of it. And in verses 12 through 16... We can see that the outcome of leaders 
and people who use their gifts in ministry will become a strong, healthy church. Read along with me as I read verses 12 through 16. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. See, the outcome of leaders and people using their gifts in ministry will be a strong, healthy church. At the beginning of verse 12, actually the end part of verse 12, you have to the building up of the body of Christ. And at the end of verse 16, you have causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So it's like brackets or bookends. The phrase building up the body of Christ is the reason why we use our gifts in ministry, that the church might be built up. But another outcome is unity of the faith, it's said in verse 13. A growing in our knowledge of the Son of God, it's said in verse 13. And then in verse 14, we develop a strong theology so that we wouldn't be gullible children who are easily deceived by the trickery of men. A unity of the faith. Another outcome is that we become mature, spiritually mature. It says in verse 13, a mature man, actually a perfect man. It goes on to say in this idea of maturity, moving toward the fullness of Christ, becoming more and more like Jesus Christ, it says in verse 13. In verse 15, we are to grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head. And another outcome is, since Christ is the head and we are the body, and he purposely fitted and holds us together. And when each individual is properly working in love, then the body of Christ, meaning the church, will grow and be built up. But you notice the converse is also true. When the body, its leaders, and its people do not use their gifts, then the body or the church stops growing, becomes unhealthy, becomes weak. Christ is the head, the church membership is the body. We are the body, and we are to use our gifts to make the body strong. And the strength of a church is proportionately correlated to the number of people using their giftedness. Thirdly, why should we use our gifts? Well, because God will reward you for using your gifts. He's going to reward you. When you use your gifts in ministry, each one of us one day will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed, rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Each one of us one day will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14, verses 10, the end of verse 10 and verse 12, also says, For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And verse 12 goes on to say, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. In 1 Corinthians 3, verses 11 through 15, Paul writes, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evidence. For the day will show it, 
This is the judgment day. The day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself, meaning the judgment itself, will test the quality of each man's work. What we do on this earth matters. Verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on, meaning built on the foundation, if it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. There's a reward coming for all of us who use our gifts for the building up of the body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus will reward his faithful servants. You remember the parable that Jesus told, meaning the parable of the talents, where he gives one guy five talents, one guy two talents, and one guy just one talent. And he says, go and do business until I come back. And the first two guys, the ones that got the five and the two, they went and did business according to the Lord's command, the master's command. But the other guy hid his talent in the ground and did no business with it. But when Jesus comes, when the Lord of the manor comes back and he calls them in to give an account of what they've done, the one guy says, Lord, you gave me five, master, you gave me five, and I made five more. And here are the words that Jesus says. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who was only given two talents and he made two other talents, he got the same commendation from the Lord. But the one who hid his talent never used it. He got chastised and punished for not using the gift, the talent that the master had given him. Jesus will reward his faithful stewards. Is your desire one day to hear the Lord say of you, well done, good and faithful servants? You were faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. I'm assuming you have come into a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm speaking to the church. And if so, the Spirit of God has given you a gift, maybe more than one, but he's given you a gift. You and I have a special gift, a grace, so to speak, undeserved, unearned. It's just given to us by God. Do you know what your gift is? Have you been using your gift in some kind of ministry for for Christ? The best way to determine what your spiritual gift is is really not taking a test to determine whether you have that gift. The best way to determine what your spiritual gift is is to get involved in a ministry. See where the Spirit starts prompting you to serve in that ministry. He's going to excite you with some aspect of that ministry. You may not think you have a teaching gift, but the Spirit of God might say, try this. And when you do it, you find the Spirit of God working through you. I don't know what your gift is, but the best way to determine what your gift is is to get involved in ministry and see what your spirit leads, excites you, and empowers you to serve. But don't forget, one day, each one of us will stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of how we used the gifts that have been given to us. If you haven't used it yet, it's not too late to begin now. If God's Spirit has given you the gift of encouragement, exhortation, then start encouraging people. If God's given you the gift of service, start serving in some manner. If it's leadership, start to take a leadership role. If it's teaching, begin teaching. Go through that list that's on the back page and see where God has given you a gift. Is it giving? Do you find joy in giving? What's your gift? Use it. It builds up the body of Christ. Can you visualize the power of Faith Community Church of each one of us? We're using the gifts that God has given. Well, we'll become a maturing body of believer. We'll be looking more like Jesus Christ. We will become a theologically strong church, a unity of faith, and growing in our knowledge of God's Son. 
And we won't fall for these false teachings that are prevalent all through our society. We'll know what the truth is. And we'll be a loving church. Notice in Ephesians 4, it said, speaking the truth in love and growing up in all aspects into Christ, who is our head. Love will predominantly reign in our church when we're all using our gifts. What do you visualize as a future for Faith Community Church? What's, what's our future look like to you? Is it a positive future where the leaders and the congregation are using their gifts for the building up of the church, that we would become a strong and healthy church? Do you, do you visualize that? Or are you visualizing a negative future? A church in decline because only the pastors are expected to use their ministry gifts. Only those in leadership positions like children's ministry director and women's ministry director, they're the ones that are to be using their gifts. And we pay them to do that. Therefore, they're to do the work of the ministry. Is that your vision? Because if that's your vision, it's a negative vision, and it means that our church will decline spiritually as well as numerically. What do you visualize for our church? I'm looking for a positive future for Faith Community Church. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we come before you giving you thanks for what you've been teaching us through the scriptures this morning. Thank you for showing us why we should use the gifts that you've given it's the Spirit of God. He's the one who personally has given each of us a spiritual, a gift, a grace. And Lord, it is clear that the number of people who are using their gifts will be correlated to whether we're growing or declining as a church. We thank you that even though you're the one who's given us a gift, you're the one that's also going to reward us for using that gift. You gave it, and you'll reward us for being faithful. I pray that our congregation will be faithful in using the gifts that the Spirit of God has given. Grow our church, Lord, not just numerically. Grow us spiritually. Help us all to attain to the unity of the faith. Help us to mature in Christ so that we look like Jesus Christ as a church. We pray this in his name. Amen. A couple of announcements before um, we close out this section. We expect to be outside for two more Sundays, this Sunday and next Sunday, which is October 4th. And then we plan on being inside for the rest of the fall and the winter. We'll be holding two different services. We're separating the chairs by 10 feet for social distancing purposes. The 8.30 service will meet in the gym and a 10.30 service will meet here in the worship center. We ask that as you come into the gym and or as you exit the gym or as you come into the worship center and as you exit the worship center that you show well, kindness to everyone else that you would wear a mask as you're coming in to find your seats. We look forward to seeing you in person, in church, on the 11th, either at the first or second service. If there's any feeling of being on ease because of this COVID-19 virus that's still out there, please continue to watch online at home. We enjoy the fact that you are watching our services. If you can, would you drop us a line, send us a, a note on our Facebook page or through our uh, website that I've been watching the services and they've been blessing me. We look forward to getting in touch with you if you have been watching our services. God bless. Have a great week in our Lord Jesus Christ.
corazón, de corazón, de solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, and what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter. alone and we know that we can't serve him without his help so be reminded of that truth this week it's great worshiping with you this morning and just a reminder that we are meeting in person we'll be gathering here at the church next sunday lord willing at 10 a.m we'll also be online and then starting october 11th we will be having two indoor services one in the worship center one in the gym 
the gym service will begin at 8.30, and then in the worship center will be meeting at 10.30. And another change is that starting October 11th, we will be live streaming the service at 10.30. So we'll be moving up half an hour. So make sure to put that on your calendars um, that we will not be having our live stream at 10 a.m. beginning October 11th, but 10.30. So have a great week in the Lord, and we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you.